I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you with us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And when I'm a prosecutor and I'm trying to case or arguing with defense attorneys here on television, when there's, um, you know, circumstantial evidence, they attack, 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 right? It's just a circumstantial case. You don't have any direct evidence of this. It's merely circumstantial. I mean, I still can hear it in my in my head. The defense attorneys when I was in the courtroom saying, ladies and gentlemen, this is merely a circumstantial case. And I always make the argument that circumstantial evidence many times is better than direct evidence. But the trial of Curtis Reeves is all about direct evidence. First of all, you've got a video. Now, the video, as we've been saying, is grainy, but that's direct evidence. That is video of the alleged crime. That is direct evidence evidence okay you also have eyewitnesses the other moviegoers who were there that night who saw what happened when curtis reeves shot and killed chad olson inside that movie theater so you've got eyewitnesses direct evidence video direct evidence and guess what at the end of the day of course the defense also attacks direct evidence it's their jobs but, but I just I just find it incredibly ironic because they say there's no direct evidence when you've got circumstantial evidence. Then when you've got direct evidence, they attack that and talk about how unreliable it is and try to impeach the credibility of the eyewitnesses, who in this case are actually more important as ear witnesses, right? Because we see the video, but we don't know what people are saying. We don't know what the tone of the conversation is. We don't know who was saying what, and you really don't see Chad Olson. But today in the courtroom down in Pasco County, Florida, you had a series of eyewitnesses, people who just wanted to see a Mark Wahlberg movie, who ended up seeing much, much more. Mr. Cummings, directing your attention to January 13th of 2014, do you recall that day? Yes, I do. Is that day special to you? Yes. Can you tell the members of this jury why? Because it's my birthday. When you went into the theater, can you tell the members of this jury what the lighting conditions were inside there? Well, there was midlight. It was not dark, it was not light. It was midlight. Okay. So there was enough light to see. All right, so it wasn't completely dark like the movie was playing? Absolutely not, no. The previews are going, and during the previews, does anything draw your attention to your left? Yes, it does. Okay, what is the first thing that you saw or heard? First thing I saw was a light from your cell phone. Okay. And would that have been Mr. Olson's cell phone? It was Mr. Olson's cell phone. Where was it? I believe it was on his lap. All right, so you noticed it, and then what'd you do? Back to watching the previews. Okay. What's the next thing that happens? The next thing that happened is uh, someone is talking to Mr. Olson about the cell phone. Did Mr. Olson respond to this gentleman? Yes, he said something along the lines of, I'm texting my babysitter or I'm texting my daughter's babysitter. Was he screaming? No. Was he angry? No. Was he agitated at that time? No, informative. Prior to the shot, did you ever see Mr. Olson climbing over his chair? No, I did not. Did you ever see him throw a punch? No, I did not. Did you ever see him throw an object? No, I did not. He had a frown on his face when he was passing in front of me. Mm -hmm. He was mumbling. And if you think of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and you see Grumpy, that's what he looked like. I could see that there was something going on, so I turned to look, and um, Mr. Olson had stood up, and he looked at Mr. Reeves, and he said, you went and reported me. Okay. Now, when you say that Mr. Olson had stood up, is he in his row? Yes, 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 yes. No, he never left his row. He just stood in front of his seat, and he looked at Mr. Reeves, and he said, you went and reported me, or something to that effect. Okay, and then what happened next? Well, the first thing I knew, popcorn went flying, and almost immediately, I, I saw Mr. Reeves' hand come up, 
and I saw a flash of red, and I thought, what the heck? It, it was a, there was a loud noise. It smelled. And then I thought, oh, my God, you shot him. And then I saw Chad also turn around to, to go out the row, like he, he was going to exit the row. But then he fell right in front of me. Did you ever see this, a life and death struggle occurring before any shot fired? No, sir. Did you ever hear the defendant yelling, no, 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 or whoa, 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 or anything like that? No, sir. Did you see any objects go flying across the movie theater? Okay, not talking about the popcorn, but any other objects before that? No, sir. Okay. Did you ever hear the defendant exclaim anything as if he was hit by an object? No, sir. Did you ever see the defendant react as if he was just hit by something and he was, he was incredibly injured? No, sir. While you're watching the event for the very first time, all right, did you ever see Mr. Reeves with his hand out and Mr. Olson chest almost on his hand and Mr. Reeves going, whoa, 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 or no, no, no? No, sir. There it is. I mean, these are the eyewitnesses. You've got the video. The defense, though, says it's all about self-defense, and they're, they're describing something that sounds a lot different than what the eyewitnesses, what the direct evidence is describing. Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae was in Pasco County, Florida, all day today and has more for us tonight. Four eyewitnesses took to the stand today to tell this jury about what they saw from their perspective inside of that theater shooting scene. And generally, they did testify to similar things. There were some variations, but one that's especially going to benefit this prosecution is the timing element. They each echoed a split second decision that they say happened between the time of the popcorn being pushed and the gunfire that they heard. Here's Jane Roy, one of those eyewitnesses. Between the time that you saw popcorn in the air and the shooting, how much time was that? Between the popcorn and the shooting? I'm going to say almost five, six seconds. Okay, we'll he, go back to the time of the popcorn. The popcorn went flying. The, the popcorn didn't have time to come down, and his arm came up. In addition to Roy, here's a comparison of what those eyewitnesses have testified to, including the widow of Chad Olson, who testified yesterday. Nicole Olson, his widow, said that she didn't see the popcorn grab that has been uh, put into evidence or testified to about her husband in his encounter with Reeves. She said she didn't hear her husband use any expletives during this exchange, and she didn't see him throw anything like an object at the defendant. And Charles Cummings took to the stand today he said that he saw popcorn in the air then saw a flash and heard a bang didn't hear Chad Olson using any expletives and did not see him throw any objects or a punch he was sitting on the back row of that theater also sitting on the back row of that theater husband and wife Angela and Alan Hamilton first Angela saw popcorn flying then immediately heard a gunshot and saw a flash she did, however, hear Chad Olson use an expletive and didn't see him throw any kind of object. Her husband was an off-duty officer, Alan Hamilton, who was there. He described it as Chad Olson flicking popcorn. Then that he saw a muzzle blast and the sound of a firearm within a couple of seconds. He also heard Chad Olson use an expletive and didn't see Olson lean completely over his chair or hit Curtis Reeves with force. Hamilton was the last person who testified as an eyewitness on the stand today. That was followed by law enforcement officials who were investigators on the scene. And we expect to hear from many more of them coming up tomorrow. Reporting in Pasco County, Florida, Julia Jane with Court TV. All right, let's bring in the think tank. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, former federal prosecutor and law professor at Texas Southern University, Michael Sterling, in Seattle, Washington, trial attorney Ann Bremner, and in West Palm Beach, Florida, former police lieutenant and trial attorney Rick King. Great to see everyone tonight. Ann Bremner, I'm going to start with you ladies first tonight. Okay. Grumpy. To me, that was the most powerful word of the day because it sets the tone for who this guy was that night inside the theater, Mr. Grumpy. Right. No, and then Grumpy, and that's what exactly it looked like when he went by. I mean, he was basically in a mood that he was, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's like, 
from the sublime to the ridiculous. You go to a movie and this happens. It, I think with these eye and ear witnesses, this, the state's got a pretty compelling case, even though, as we know, it's eight years old. Michael Sterling, um, there was some cursing. I, I'm sure they were arguing. Uh, I'm sure they were. And, 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 and I'm sure Chad Olson flicked that popcorn out of his, out of his lap or wherever uh, Curtis Reeves had it. Um, but it was before the popcorn could fall to the ground, Curtis Reeves is already shooting Chad Olson. To me, that's a very powerful image. Yeah, I think so, Vinny. Uh, I know as esteemed members of the bar, we never use that kind of language and have never heard or seen anyone use that kind of language in our in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, so I'm not sure how the expletives come into play in terms of a self-defense argument. But I mean, I think the question comes down to, as we've seen many times, it comes down to proportionality, right? You know, part of the reason that you're entitled to self-defense is when you're being threatened with deadly force. So when you're using lethal force against someone in defense of yourself and others, oftentimes it comes down to proportionality. And so in this case, you have a, someone bringing a gun to a popcorn fight. Rick King, I wanna compare you to Curtis Reeves. Both members of law enforcement down in Florida, both retired, and then Curtis Reeves, you decide to get uh, your degree in your, your JD and you become an esteemed attorney, highly respected. Curtis Reeves decides to go around to movie theaters and confront people who are uh, <laughs> using their cell phones. Your, your careers kind of diverge at that point. Uh, yes, yes. So, um, yes, we're a little different in that also Mr. Reeves is in his 70s. Um, I am in my <clears throat> something, but I'm I'm younger than Mr. Reeves. Much younger. Uh, <laughs> so, the, I well, I, I agree with Michael with with respect to the proportionality of his response to Mr. Olson's um, aggressiveness. I think it's going to come, out, and I agree, it's going to come down to that. Um, but as this, as a the, what the defense is going to argue is that as a 70 year old man, um, his perception. And for some people, perception is reality. His, his perception of what Mr. Olson was doing, whether he was coming over the chair and their ability to articulate that, I think ultimately, and I think we, sh I, we would all agree that um, Mr. Reed's gonna have to take the stand and explain what his perception was at that time. Mm -hmm. it, it seems though, he still had the very quick draw. Like, okay, he's 71, his perception's off, but he's able to do a very quick uh, a draw there. I mean, before the popcorn hits the ground, he's got the gun out and he's firing and 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 not only killing Chad Olson, but also shooting uh, Nicole Olson in her hand, Rick. Um, that's a powerful image. Yeah. That's powerful. And that's powerful testimony. That's going to be a, uh, it's, it's going to be a thing in this trial. Like, I mean, I don't know how you um, overcome that image when it comes down to how fast you retaliated in that point. Um, I know his argument is that he felt as though Chad Olson was coming over the chair at him and he feared the attack of a younger man being an older man. Um, and that's why he resorted to mm -hmm. deadly force. You know, it's I don't interesting. know if the... And Vinny, it's, 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 it's particularly powerful when you consider how she describes it, that she's actually restraining her husband, that she's pulling him back. In other words, this becomes a powerful piece of evidence in terms of whether he was coming at her. She's restraining him, pulling her back, and while she's doing so, she gets shot in the hand while she's trying to pull her husband back. So you have this powerful testimony that not only is he not coming at her, but somebody's actually helping to restrain him to try to bring the peace and calm the situation down. But doesn't that play both ways? In that Mr. Reeves recognizes that she's trying to stop him as he's coming, that that kind of lends credence to what he was saying about Chad coming over the chair. She testifies she's trying to stop him. And so maybe his perception was he's coming, she's trying to stop him, she's not gonna be able to, I'm in danger, I'm 70, he's older. And so I do what I gotta do. Um, I don't know if that's gonna carry the day, but I can understand where that would be the argument. So Ann Bremner, one final question here. Um, most trials, the, the defense attorneys will We'll talk about circumstantial evidence. It's merely circumstantial. This case is all direct right. evidence. This is video, and this is eye and ear witnesses, and um, still will be attacked by the defense. 
Well, you know, I always say on circumstantial evidence, witnesses can and do lie. They can be mistaken, but evidence never lies. You know, that, I love circumstantial evidence. The jury instruction says it's as valid as direct evidence. So, yeah, they're going to go up and say, oh, well, eight years old. We don't have other, we don't have forensic evidence. We don't have any kind of, you know, compelling physical evidence. And these are people that were watching a movie and then something quickly happened in front of them. And we can't trust eyewitnesses. And that's what we hear on a direct evidence case, right? Well, you, you it, so I just have this one question see. then for the defense bar. If we can't trust, if we can't trust eyewitnesses, <laughs> And circumstantial cases are flimsy. Then right. what are we? What are we left? We're left with almost nothing. We have to have a confession right. and a videotape, and those are the only people that should ever be convicted, according to the defense bar. 